It's so good to worship together today. If you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to turn to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. If you're new to the area, maybe you've recently moved to this region, welcome to Seattle. So, so good to have you here. Now, it has been a little crazy with all this rain, but uh, Lord willing, the sun will return to Texas, right? So it is good to have the temperatures a little cooler. We continue this morning in our series that we have called Life in Christ as we talk about kind of some specific core competencies or core aspects of this journey we have in Jesus. And the reality is we, we, we've, we've kind of put this illustration to it, if you will. And if you've been here the last few weeks, you understand that. It's this illustration of a tree. And so if you can get that image in your mind, the first two weeks we talked about being rooted in the scripture and being rooted in prayer. And so as those roots go deep, really then that trunk becomes what we call faith and obedience. And that grows and grows and grows as we draw near to Christ through scripture and through prayer. We trust him more. We follow him better in the ways he's called us to. And then today we kind of make that transition where we begin talking about the branches and what do those look like. And so this first one, I would say it this way, is the quintessential place where we begin to bear fruit. It is really our mission as a church, and we're calling that disciple maker, a disciple maker. I want to read you this quote from a guy named Bill Hull, who has given his life really uh, to to discipleship and to equipping and training around what that word means, especially battling, battling it in the context of what kind of has become in the church. And here's what he says. Discipleship isn't a program or an event. It's a way of life. It's not for a limited time, but for our whole life. Discipleship isn't for beginners alone. It's for all believers for every day of their life. Discipleship isn't just one of those things the church does. It is what the church does. And understanding the gravity of that, discipleship is critical. Making disciples is absolutely critical to this church going forward, as well as every church in the broader, broader context of especially our culture going forward. Just to understand even a little bit of the statistics in our region, so we're in Collin County where the church is located. Our county over the past four years has grown at about a clip of 4% per year. So if you add that up, add a little bit because it grows 4% each year, that's 16 plus percent over the past four years. Over that same period of time, if you take the churches and the association that we're in, a large number of churches have grown 1% in that same four years which means we're not even keeping up with growth. It's startling because here's the reality that's begun to set in in the Dallas area and North Dallas area is that for years and years we've been a little bit insulated from what's happening across the rest of the country because we have a significant number of believers who live here. You've heard it called the Bible Belt. I think that's appropriate to say. And so what happens is we grow when others move in who are believers and they come and join our church and that's fantastic. We want to continue for that to happen. But there's a reality to us moving forward as a church as the culture becomes more and more secular that we have an opportunity to go and make disciples. So on one hand, it's a little bit scary to think about the future of the church when you look at just the numbers. But on the other hand, it is the greatest opportunity that we have because no longer is there this existence of what I would say is called cultural Christianity, where I think I'm a Christian because I kind of grew up that way or my parents grew up that way or I went to church as a kid. And now the culture is saying, you know what, I don't even want to have anything to do with that, which is a beautiful opportunity. Because then now we get to shine the light of the true Jesus in their lives and get to make disciples and watch what God does through us in a powerful way, transforming our neighborhoods and our communities. It is essential, this thing called being a disciple maker. So with that in mind, would you, if you're physically able, stand with me in honor of reading God's word, Matthew chapter 28, we're going to read 16 through 20. It says, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. 
And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Father, we thank you for these words. We thank you for the truth that is in them and how you, through your spirit, want to transform our lives. And so we ask you to do that. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can have a seat. So if you've been around church probably any length of time, you've heard this passage rightly called the Great Commission. Right? It is the great, and I'm going to kind of take the co-op. It's the great mission that we are called to go and take part in. But before we get there, I think that verses 16 and 17 speak a lot to a little bit more of the story of this great commission or this great mission. If you have your notes, you can follow along with that. And the first thing that we actually get to see in this passage is something that's pretty startling. In verse 16, it says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And you start to say, why, why is Matthew recording this? What's he recording in this situation? So the 11 disciples. And if you've read through the book of Matthew, you know that sounds a little bit f- different than what you would have expected because all along we've seen the 12. The 12 disciples, the 12 that Jesus called, the 12 that began to follow him, that he poured his life into over three years. And now we get to this point, and it's almost startling in the text if we had read it all the way through and got to this point and said, now the 11, because you realize something has happened. And really over the past two weeks in the lives of Jesus' disciples, it has been tragic. It's been crazy. It's been probably chaotic at times, and I would say traumatic. And so understanding, when we see that phrase 11, I think what we're seeing is not just that there's a count of 11 guys, but beginning to get into their minds all that has happened over the past two weeks. Remember, these are the guys that dropped everything to follow Jesus, and for the last three years in their life, they have been following him to the nth degree, to every place that he goes, uh, walking along in the path that's right beside him in this rabbinical context. As they are living together, they're breathing together, they're walking together, they're beginning to look and smell like Jesus and act like Jesus. They're his followers, his guys that he's recruited. And then as he told them all along, a couple of weeks ago, They were celebrating the Sabbath. And again, he tells them, I'm going to go and I'm going to die. And they hadn't fully got it yet, but this moment in their life where they rent since something something different is happening. They celebrate the Sabbath together. They leave. They go to the garden called Gethsemane. And and as they're there, they're praying in the garden. And Jesus literally praying to the point where he's sweating blood because of the intensity of his prayers and about what he's about to go through. Right, and then right after that, he gets arrested, and these disciples who have been with him all along for the first time scatter from him in the midst of his arrest. Peter even denies him three times. Imagine some of the other disciples knowing he was going to be denied or watching this all take place. And then Jesus, this one they've loved, this one they've followed, he literally goes to a cross after this mock trial, and he hangs there and he dies. And they were there when they put him in the grave. And then after that, we kind of get this sense they're in Jerusalem and they're hiding out. There's fear, there's anxiety, there's wonder. They've given their lives to follow this guy. Now everything has fallen apart. What are we going to do now? And then there's hope. The ladies who are following Jesus, some of the women who had followed him, find that he had been raised from the dead and there's life breathed in but at the same time there's still this uh, this do we believe him or not and then we see in one of the gospels that Jesus literally visits them and so they get this picture of Jesus and all of a sudden he's right there in front of them the resurrected Jesus and now what what does this all mean what's happening and I, and I love this phrase in verse 16 because it gives us a glimpse of Jesus even in this moment leading them he says now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them he's telling them where to go and so in the chaos of that, in what's going through the minds of, their, of his disciples, right, they're processing through all of this. He tells them, go meet me in Galilee. Now, why Galilee? Because Galilee was the place it all began. And I can only imagine as they're walking on that road from Jerusalem north to Galilee, that as they begin to get into that comfortable place, that's the place where they're all from, And 
is begin to see, hey, remember, remember what happened over here? Hey, do you remember when, when that storm came up? And just with his words, Jesus calmed the water. Hey, do you remember when we spent the night over there and we didn't know what was going to happen the next day when all those thousands of people were with us and, and we didn't have anything to food them and feed them and God did this incredible miracle right in our midst? Hey, remember what happened? And all of a sudden, the stories I can imagine begin to come back up as they begin to remember who Jesus is. And it begins to filter through and to walk through Galilee on the place to the place where Jesus had led him to go. The story began there. Matthew 4 reminds us of this in verse 12. Speaking of Jesus, it says, Now when he had heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. And from that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is the place where Jesus began. And you can imagine that light even in their hearts dawning again as they realize he's called them back here. He's about to give them this mission. This mission that would literally change the world. And yet before he does, he's calling them back to reconnect with him. Because before they can undertake the mission, they need to reconnect with a great relationship. And that's their relationship with their king and their savior, Jesus, and their friend. And so as they're walking up, they're remembering this is where it began. Not only that, but this is where they were called. Verse 18, right after that same passage, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. The story begins here. Their calling begins here. So why Galilee? Because I think the greatest motivation and preparation that we can have for God's mission is a relationship with him that's thriving. And he calls them back to a place where they fall in love with Jesus. And they remember all of the things that not only that he's done, but all of the times that they had, the joy that they had, the moments that they had. And he's bringing them back into this place and kind of saying, this is real. It's all been real. This was all part of the plan. They walked with him there. And you know what? I think it's the same for us. That sometimes we can take a journey that if we look back and go, you know what, five years ago I felt so close to God, but now because maybe it's decisions that I've made or, or the path of life that's been on circumstances, I just don't feel that anymore, I just don't remember it. Or maybe you've just never really felt that journey or that, that, that closeness to God. And we see this even in some of the, the New Testament writers as they're writing books about this, that they just are, are in love with Jesus. There's this this enamoring with Jesus because it's this person that calls us to the mission. It really begins with that relationship with him because otherwise it just becomes religious practice. I love it when Paul writes in Colossians 1, almost just in the midst of his opening letter to the church at Colossae, he just overflows with Jesus. And here's what he says. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on heaven, in he on earth, or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. As Christ followers... Step one, before the mission even begins, is that we fall in love with our Savior. The God who created us, who spoke us into existence. And I understand as I look around the room and see a lot of men, 
That's a little bit weird sometimes to say. I don't mean that in any weird sense, but that we would be so enamored with the God of all creation and understand not only is he the God of all creation, but he is a personal, loving God who pours into our lives, who walks with us through every situation and circumstance. And when we become so enamored with Jesus, then we live out the strength and the love that he pours into us and to others. And we have the courage that we never thought we have, that we find abundance in life that we never thought possible because we are designed to connect with God in that way. And so that's the first step. Jesus had directed them to this mountain. And by the way, you sense their obedience there in verse 16. And then verse 17 says this, and when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And so you kind of get the picture of what's happening. They're meeting on this mountain and maybe Jesus has beat him. He's at the top. Um, you know, maybe he was more in shape or whatever. So he got up there first and then the disciples are kind of coming up and maybe there's a little bit of a distance between them and they kind of see him and they begin to worship him. Why are they worshiping him? Because they know who he is at this point. They have seen the resurrected Jesus. They know he is God, no doubt. They've walked with him. They've seen it displayed. And now in this incredible, all-encompassing miracle called the resurrection, and he in his resurrected form is there, and they begin to worship him. You know what? But I love the next phrase. It says, and some doubted, or but some doubted. You know why I think that's good? Because it's real. Because some of us have been walking with Jesus a long time, but there's still that moment where you go, oh. And that happens in real life. What's interesting about this word, this word is only used twice in all of the New Testament. This word that says that he doubted. It's used the other time when Peter is, begins to, or attempts to walk out on the water, and he does for just a moment. Then it, he has what is called, he doubts, and Jesus says, why did you doubt? And he begins to sink, and Jesus rescues him from it. And the word is not unbelief. So it would have been easy for Matthew to use that word in this context. It's not unbelief. The word doubt literally means more along the lines of uncertainty, hesitation, or indecision. Uncertainty, hesitation, or indecision. And Jesus, in this moment, as he's calling them, and they again, they're processing through all of this, and now Jesus shows up, just like he said he would. They come, and they're worshiping him, but you can imagine what's flowing in their minds. Now what? What's going to happen? How do we move forward from here? What's this going to look like? And I love what the verse says next. And Jesus came. If we pause there and think about that for just a minute, that God in the flesh didn't stop just to be worshiped. But he wants a relationship. And he came to his disciples. And I think in the context of what they're, the situation they're in, is that it's almost you get this intimate moment with these 11 disciples and Jesus walks right up to them. And here's what he says, first words, all authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. Hey guys, I got this. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. In the midst of their doubting, in their indecision, in their uncertainty, in the moment of what's next, of how's this all going to work out, of what's life going to look like now. We've given everything for you, Jesus. We don't understand all these things. And he kind of calls them all in and he goes, I got this. I am who I said that I am all along. And all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. You can trust me. And he pulls them back into the greatest relationship they could ever have before he sends them onto the greatest mission that they could ever go on. Because it's in coming back to him and recognizing who he is and that all strength and power and authority and all that is rested in him. And now because of him, we can go out and fulfill that. When that's right, God does amazing and incredible things through his church, things that we've never even seen before in history, things that are amazing in our communities, in our families, in our homes. He restores marriages. He restores lives. He brings people who we think are the furthest from him to salvation because we're resting in him and all authority in heaven and on earth is his. 
And we're his kids. Can you imagine the strength that would have flowed into those men, those young men who would then give their lives for the sake of the gospel? He goes on next, verse 19, and begins to give them the great mission. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Go and make disciples. So for us to get that word, I think it's fair for us to give a kind of a definition to that because so often in the church, what and it's not by purpose or on purpose, it's kind of by accident that over years we've kind of relegated that word discipleship to classes, right? If you remember Sunday evening discipleship classes, or you remember uh, maybe even in student ministry, we still have a phrase we call disciple now weekend. And understanding those things are part of the story, but a disciple has nothing to do with an event or a program. A disciple defined as simply this, one who follows Jesus and teaches others to do the same. A disciple is one who follows Jesus and teaches others to do the same. And what I hope we can do is take the scary out of that word. Because if all of us, every single one of us, if you're a Christ follower, is designed to make disciples, then it's not something that we can just blow off. And it's not a word that we need to be afraid of. As you follow Jesus, you're a little bit ahead of probably someone else. And you can begin pulling them into the story and making a disciple of them who goes and does the same. So one who follows Jesus and teaches others to do the same. Jesus said, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And interestingly, he starts there that this go to make disciples starts with baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it's this clear proclamation of the gospel. And again, recapturing that word disciple or disciple maker in the context of, I think, biblical context, that evangelism actually is not a separate thing from discipleship. It is the exact same thing. It's just the beginning step that they go and begin to share the gospel because in that baptism of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, what they're saying is we're pulling people, we're, we're, we're preaching the truth, we're teaching God's word, and God is drawing people to himself. And they're becoming saved, and then the response of that is that baptism, which is the proclamation of now I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, that going and making disciples begins with sharing the gospel. So can I ask you this? Do you know how to share the gospel? We've talked about it multiple times this year from this platform. I know Josh not too long ago talked about even the three circles and the, a strategy to share the gospel, and those are so good. I'm so thankful that we have strategies and tools like that, but they're worthless if we don't ever use them. And the simple gospel is this, that God loves us and he wants a relationship with us, with you. But our sin separates us from God because he's holy and he's other. We've sinned, and the Bible says that all of us have sinned and fall short of God's glory. And there's nothing we can do to get back right with God. There's nothing I can do, no amount of good works I can have, and all of that to save me. Only Jesus can do that, and that's exactly why Jesus came. He was the one who was the perfect sacrifice who paid for my sins and for your sins on the cross. He defeated sin, and then when he rose three days later, he defeated death giving everyone the opportunity to have life, and life that begins now in abundance and it lasts forever. So how does someone make that decision? You simply admit that you're a sinner and that you need a savior. Believe that Jesus is the only way, the one who died for you, and then confess him as your Lord. The Bible says you will be saved. If you were leading someone to Christ, you would then pray a prayer. And that simple prayer would just say, God, I admit that I'm a sinner and that I need a savior. I admit that Jesus is the only way for me to have salvation from my sins, freedom from my sin, and to walk in a new life. And so I confess Jesus as my Lord and savior. Would you come in and change me and make me new? In Jesus' name, amen. And that's it. 
There's no magic to it. It's beginning to share the gospel, the truth, the life-changing message that frees people from sin and then begins them on this path. And that's what's great is the path doesn't stop there, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them then to observe everything that I've commanded. So that next step then is we begin teaching them. And for some, uh, that teaching, that word has this connotation of school right, that you're in rows and there's a teacher up in the front. And and there can be an element of that, absolutely, but teaching is much broader than that in the sense that teaching them to observe everything that they've commanded at times is going to be teaching the masses. At times it's going to be thousands that Jesus taught, if you remember that in the story, where they would gather around him and he would have these amazing sermons that he would teach. At times in our context, it looks like this, right, where there's a large setting of teaching that happens. And other times Jesus would pull aside, uh, it was 72 in Luke chapter 10, and sends them on a mission. He spends time with those 72, investing in them. A lot of times what we see in the scripture is 12. He spends time with his 12 disciples, now 11 in the story where we are today. And then other times we see where he invested in a three. And all of that is discipleship, pouring into them, teaching them. But at some point, it has to get to those smaller groups. And that we hold one another accountable, that we walk with one another, that we pull things out when we see things in our own lives that we aren't walking in the way that God's called us to walk that we would make disciples, teaching them to observe everything that he's commanded. Another piece of that that Jesus, from the very beginning, articulated so clearly, going back in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, it says this, and he said to them, when he approached those guys who were fishing, and he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus began with the end in mind. Because how do we know we've made a disciple? When the person we've discipled begins discipling others. Because it's disciples who make disciples. Jesus didn't just say, come and follow me and be transformed. He said, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That you will go and make disciples. 2 Timothy 2, 2, we see it this way. As Paul's writing to Timothy, he looks at him and he says, entrust these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So in that picture, you have Paul, who's discipled Timothy, and now Timothy is entrusting these things to faithful men, and those faithful men are entrusting them to others who will follow. So four generations of disciples who make disciples who make disciples. So what does that look like for us? So this hit me this week on Tuesday. I was at a kind of a gathering. It was called a discipleship roundtable of churches in our state. And there's about 15 um, churches that were represented there. Um, And there was a guy who was speaking who's, these are all pastors in the room. And a pastor who was probably his late 50s was speaking and just kind of sharing with the group and their church is doing some amazing things around discipleship and, and kind of in these small groups. And he said, you know, for years, I had been in ministry for years and realized I didn't know how to disciple anybody because no one had ever discipled me. And he said, and I grew up and my dad was a pastor. So he grew up in a pastor's home and he was not slamming his dad by any means. He praised his dad and the way uh, his dad led his family, but he was never discipled. And so even as a pastor, not knowing how to truly disciple somebody. And so for me, what I wrote down in that moment is, may it never be that my kids would say that because that's on me that when they leave my home at 18 years old, that they know how to make a disciple. It changes things, doesn't it? Because it's not just capturing those God moments, which we need to do, the times God shows up in their life and trying to help them develop a biblical worldview. It's not just teaching those faith talks week after week, which we need to be doing, that we're establishing spiritual authority in our home, that we're going through the scriptures as a family. It's not just pouring in, it's pouring in so that they can pour out. And all of us have been there. When you go to some kind of a meeting or a conference or something and someone looks at you and says, I just want you to take notes and learn these things, that's great. But when someone looks at you and says, by the way, at the end of this, you're going to be teaching it, we take notes a lot more, don't we? Because we understand that's the end game, that our disciples would make disciples who would make disciples, that generationally from now, you would see fruit that has borne fruit that has borne fruit 
because we've been faithful to be obedient to God, to go and make disciples, teaching them to observe everything that he's commanded. The last piece of this, in this passage, or this verse, it says, we skipped over it intentionally, now coming back to it, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. What's great about that is that I hope some of our disciples don't look anything like us. They don't have the same backgrounds that we have. They don't come from the same family of origin. Maybe they're socioeconomically different than we are, but we have a calling as the church, as those who are Christ followers, to see people as his children who need his grace and his love no matter where they are in the moment. And by the way, when we start doing that in discipleship, it gets messy. And I think we are this as a church, but may we be a church that anybody who walks in these doors on Sunday morning or into our lives, before they would sense any sort of judgment, they would sense the absolute love of Christ pouring over them. Because sometimes we get into a place where we think people should be cleaned up before they start following Jesus. And it's Jesus who cleans them up. It's not that we have to cross some line before we can walk into the church. It said, no, as we, as the church, because this is just a building, surround people who are far from God, and we love them to Jesus and watch Jesus transform their minds and their hearts to all nations. Verse 20, teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded you. And then he goes on to this last sentence of this last verse in the book of Matthew. And so it goes from this great relationship to the great mission that we have. And then here's the great promise that he gives us. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What does that mean? It means that when we go, we go in his presence. That the Holy Spirit comes and indwells the believer when we confess Jesus as Christ and that it never leaves us. As a matter of fact, the scripture says he becomes the security and seal for our eternal life and eternal salvation. So now, literally, we become the temple of the Holy Spirit. God is living inside us and he convicts and he challenges and he encourages and he instructs all along the way that we're followers of his and we have his presence no matter what we go through. Not only that, but scripture says that we have his words and his peace. It says this, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I live, leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. When we walk and we begin to make disciples in obedience, not only do we have his presence that goes with us, but we also get words and peace that comes from him. And how incredible would it have been for those disciples who are gathered around and Jesus is saying this to these 11. He's talking with them and he's saying, hey, you're going to go to some hard places. And I'm going to give you all the words that you need. And in the moment when you should be fearful, you're going to have incredible peace that overcomes you because of my Holy Spirit that is present in you. Not only that, but we sense that we are never separated from his love. Romans 8, 37 says this, Though in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, for I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. No matter what happens when we are on mission going for him in our everyday life, his love never leaves us. And then finally, we're assured of eternal life. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the Father are one. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So very practically, how do we make disciples at Parkway Hills? So right now we have two pieces of this. I would say two out of the three. We gather and worship, right? There's the bigger groom of gathering that we come together and God pricks our heart and 
challenges and encourages us as we hear his word preached, as we worship him in song, as we worship him with our giving, all of those things are a part of it. And then we have what we call life groups, right? So we engage in life groups. It means we jump in wholeheartedly to biblical community and we walk with one another in love and in grace and we hold one another accountable and we live life in such a way that it's meaningful in our Christian walk. Right, so we do that together. And then there's a third way, and that's really getting smaller uh, and what I would call more these, these smaller groups of investment, these intentional groups. I don't know if you put a word on it, life in Christ groups or whatever. And that's kind of a direction in the future that we're going to be heading. What's great about that is it's, it's intentional, but it's also what I would call organic. And what I mean by that is not that it grows plants. But organic means that you have natural relationships, that you're pouring into people that you know, that people are pouring into you that know you, and that we connect naturally and begin to make disciples in our context because it's a call on all of us that we would make disciples. So very practically then, what are the steps for you and I? So there's three places that we would go as we talk about our our strategy Right, we gather in worship, we engage in life group, and we go to our circles. Our circles meaning home, our community, and to the nations and beyond, right? To the world. So then how do we begin to do that? Four simple things. First of all this, look for the people that God has placed in your circles of influence. If you have kids at home, that's the beginning. Right there, begin making disciples of your kids at home. All right, we got to see... The Jones talk about that or celebrate that this morning in the beginning of that milestone one parent and child dedication, right? That they are committing to be the primary disciple makers of their kids, of Hallie this morning, as well as Hunter and Heath, that we would own our homes, right? So look for the people that God has placed. Maybe it's a neighbor, maybe it's a coworker, all of that. Who has he put you in influence with? So the second thing is this, that you begin to invest in the relationship, and that's prayer and time. Invest in the relationship. And what I mean by that is this, that when we begin to share the gospel with people and make a disciple, it's not a project. It's because we genuinely love people. Right? Because when we miss that other sense that, oh, I'm just your church project. No, 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 no. We genuinely love our neighbors. We genuinely love our coworkers. And so we invest in the relationship. The third thing is this, then find the right resource. So that's extremely practical. Find the right resource. What does that mean? It means that for most of us, it's helpful to have a book that we're going along that we can maybe give to that person. So I remember the very first person who really discipled me. I was about 14, and we went through a book called the 2-7 series, put out by the Navigators, 2 colon 7. It's a great place to start. It's about 30 years old. It's really simple. And you just start that journey, the 2-7 series. You know what? When I was a youth pastor and wondering how do I disciple a small group of these kids, the first thing that popped in my mind was, well, I'll go through that book. That's what somebody did for me. That's what I'll do for them. All right? So we begin to use the resources that are effective. So find the right resource. And then fourth is this. Engage with them regularly. Essentially, it means just do it. Commit week after week to engage with them regularly to make disciples, and remembering this, that all authority has been given to our Savior and to the one we're leading them to. And as we lead them to Jesus, he begins to transform them, and then we watch them become a disciple, and then at some point launching them to say, now you go and make disciples. So why should we care? One, it's a command that every Christ follower would replicate and make disciples. Second, because genuinely this is what it means to love God and then love others. To love God in our obedience to him and then to love others as an outflow of that. And then the third is this. For some of us, may have been going to Bible study for years and years and years, maybe two or three a week. And you get caught in this spin cycle of Bible study. And it's all about this, this, this. What can I get? How do I adjust? What do I need? All of that. And there's never been a significant outflow from your heart. If you want to experience 
the abundance and the joy and the incredible life it is to follow Christ, it's outward. And it's us taking the way that we've been poured into and the things that have been poured into our life and now pouring that into others. And it gets messy and there are moments you're like, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know what's coming next. I don't even know where to go next. And you trust God all the way through it and you watch him use you in a way that he never has before. And you find this incredible life in him that's meant to be outwardly focused. And what happens is one life, one home at a time, our neighborhoods become transformed. Our communities become transformed. Because we begin following what Jesus commanded from the beginning. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded you. And I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Would you bow your heads with me? In a moment, we'll have a time of response as we do at the end of our services where we get to just worship God our staff will be down front. If God's laid something on your heart that you need prayer about, whether it was related to this today or not, we would love to walk with you through prayer. If you don't know Christ and you heard me talk about that and you want to make that decision to follow him, we would absolutely love to talk with you more about that, whether it's right here or at the five-minute party after this. Just respond however God may lead you when we sing in just a moment. Father, we're so grateful for today, so grateful for your calling in our life. Grateful, Father, that we get to experience what is life in Christ day in and day out. And as those who have placed our faith and trust in you, God, I pray that you would give us eyes to see a world that needs the hope and the joy and the peace that comes in following you. And Father, would we be faithful to make disciples? sharing the gospel and pouring in your teaching and your truth until they begin, begin to make disciples who make disciples. And God, may we bear much fruit that bears much fruit for your kingdom and for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.